Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome back to the show Langston Khan. I met Langston in London in 2016 and was immediately impressed with his sincerity in using magical and shamanic techniques for compassionate ends in a contemporary setting. And as this is the final show for January, in which we wind up our series on getting one's head in the game for what is going to be an intense year, it struck me that there was probably no one better to pull a lot of these threads together for us. And so that's what we shall do. Langston, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Well, I owe you one with good audio quality, because the last time we spoke, uh, you had the exciting sounds of New York behind you, and I was on a very busy road in North London in an Airbnb. So uh, we've got our fingers crossed. The Skype gods will be kind to us this time. Uh, and, uh, and how's the jet lag? You've been, on a, you've been on a little trip recently. Yeah, I was uh, in India for a little over two weeks. Um, and uh, so I'm recovering well. It's, it's been uh, about a day and a half now. Uh, I woke up at uh, 4 a.m. this morning, um, br- bushy tailed and bright eyed. So <laughs> it's probably, probably going to crash later after we finish talking, but uh, it's, it's, it's good. Yeah, and uh, I mean, we were sort of emailing backwards and forwards to arrange this, uh, and you, you know, very diligently, you were emailing from the bus coming back from the airport. But uh, <laughs> I mean, for for an audience such as this, uh, you know, what what were some of the highlight experiences from the trip? Mm. Well, it was my first time uh, in India. I spent a lot of time in Kerala, which is in South India, like a region of South India, and. Um, some of the things that I think are most memorable for, for this type of audience was one visiting a uh, Naga temple, which was really um, special to me because some of the helping spirits that I work with are cobra spirits specifically. And this is like a beautiful temple devoted to these sort of half cobra, half human um, nature spirits, so to speak. And that such as a huge temple filled with these beautiful stone cobra statues and very active um, devotional practices of the, of the local people there. Um, I think I was one of, me and my friend were some of the only uh, foreigners that were actually taking part in this service that we were um, at this, had the privilege to be part of at this uh, temple. So that was really exciting. Um, we made some traditional offerings there and I got to experience a little bit of just what those spirits felt like, <laughs> which was a little different than I expected. Um, I, I thought they'd be very like sort of wild and primal and, and terrifying feeling, but they were terrifying. But my, what my perception of them in that sort of brief encounter in this temple service was very these sort of noble, regal spirits with these sort of piercing eyes that were would get very close to you and kind of sniff you out. So that was just very interesting to experience um, as part of my own practice. Um, and then I also was lucky enough, I, I, was, I went um, up to this place in, called Munar, which is a city in the mountains where a lot of the tea plantations are in South India. And I was told to go find this man who lives at the edge of a jungle um, by a friend. And just to, he didn't have a cell phone, just to ask for his name. Um, and so we started asking around trying to find this guy because you're told he was amazing. It's really great to meet him. And so we finally met him and we stayed at his house for a couple days. And we, he lives at like on the top of the mountain, this place called top station. And we uh, had the privilege of arriving on the third year anniversary of his mother's death day. Um, So we got to witness this sort of ancestral ceremony and feeding uh, of her spirit. Um, which is very special to me because I, I practice a lot of ancestral pra- practice myself. And it was very interesting to see these. This man was a Tamil. So we were seeing these sort of indigenous Tamil practices to honor ancestors by a man who actually was Christian along with his family, uh, but still carrying along these practices. And so after they did this service for the mother and then fed all of us, um, and she had this, this big sort of different. Food, her favorite foods laid out before her. Then the wife um, of the man we were staying with ate the food that had been served to his mother's spirit. So just this very beautiful practice of um, keeping this sort of tending and continuity 
uh, of his mother going. So I thought that was very beautiful. Yeah, that's an interesting, um, uh, I guess, manifestation of remembrance rites, because I can't, off the top of my head, it's 7 a.m. here, so maybe one will come to me, but I can't think off the top of my head of the uh, the, the wife assuming that role in, in other cultures. I'm not sure. Was that, I mean, other than that, did it... Did it have the same kind of archetypal shape of a of a ancestral rite? Yes, like it was very. Before we were told that that's what it was, it was very clear that's what was going on. There was like a white candle lit. There was a big portrait of the mother, and then there were all these traditional foods laid out in front of her on banana leaves. Um, so yeah, very very similar to other practices I was already familiar with. Though the significance of performing it on the third year of her death day anniversary. Um, was something that was somewhat new to me. So is in the sense that um, the third year is, uh, I mean, did they do them on year one and year two, or did they do different versions on it? Is is the third year like the kind of high mass version of it or something? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I didn't, the, the man spoke uh, very broken English. He, he had this really beautiful way of stringing together sort of nouns and verbs with with no real like preposition or conjunctions or anything so you you had to kind of figure out by the sequence what was what he was communicating and expressing um and so i i we talked a little bit about it but i wasn't able to get a huge amount of information so i'm actually not sure about the answer to that but i do know that the third year was especially significant in their understanding of the transition of the soul of the of the ancestor and sort of elevating them Cool. Yeah, that must have been amazing. Uh, the the Naga thing as well. Uh, I would have had an expectation that they would uh, come forth as uh, more primal, or the um, the primalness, I guess, would be closer to the surface. Because I um, ended up doing quite a bit of research on the origins of the Nagas for starships and the the kind of uh, Naga clan or um, class of spirits it very clearly was sort of absorbed into what became Hinduism from uh, yeah from, from the from the landscape it's much much older and it kind of spreads across into Southeast Asia which is where I bumped up against it so my expectation of it would have been similarly primal as well I'm sure that I, I thought that was interesting that it um, the regalness I, I get um, but that uh, would have been fascinating I'm a bit jealous <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully you can get out there sometime as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. well, uh, it's still January, and uh, one of the things I kind of hoped to do, um, I've sort of got a sequence of uh, guests, uh, and you were one of that sequence, to do with kind of putting everyone's heads in um, what I think is uh, the best or um, most appropriate game for 2018. And, uh, and you know, there's very good reason for this. We are experiencing some intense cultural G-forces from, you know, the fourth turning as we head into its corner, um, so to speak. So uh, you were, uh, you know, near the top of the list of, of people who were like, who who has a good head game and, and who is good at conveying it? And I thought, yes, I'll, um, I'll go and bother Langston um, while he's <laughs> apparently on holiday. So I guess um, first topic of discussion and um, first question along that line is, uh, I guess, what are some of the least helpful attitudes or, I guess, positions to adopt that you've encountered or seen uh, in these, um, what's what I'm looking for here, intense times? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, one of them that I this has been on my mind a lot it's just the idea that anyone is expendable i feel like right now we've gotten to an extreme in online discourse and maybe so, so in some areas it's actually improving a little bit maybe the real peak of the extreme was more last year somewhat but uh of if someone makes one misstep um feeling like now they have to just be you know excommunicated from internet land forever um Especially, I see this with people who have done many years of service uh, in different traditions or discourses. Um, and 
they say something that isn't a popular opinion or maybe is downright ignorant or wrong, but then rather than putting that statement in the context of their work, it's simply judged in our kind of, you know, post postmodern <laughs> internet landscape as as just that they're judged solely on that one statement they made in that one time and that one day. And then there's like a sort of witch hunt that happens to to sort of take them down in some way or punish them. And I think on a sort of more macro level, this can be very harmful to our communities because often the people in these discourses that are the loudest are people that don't have any contact with that person before they're actually meeting them or people who might have agendas of like past hurts with people in the, um, that, that are personal that they want to use this as an opportunity to take that person down, so to speak. And I think this makes our communities very vulnerable to, um, you know, whether it be government forces, if you want to get more into um, conspiracy theories, or, or whether it be uh, simply like, you know, alt-right trolls, uh, that, that it's a lot easier to divide communities when there's this attitude of expendability and attitude of the need for, for punishment and banishment when people make others uncomfortable for various reasons. Yeah, so um, so we're sort of balkanizing ourselves at a time where uh, it's probably better if we were growing a community rather than fragmenting it. Exactly. And I don't, I'm not the type of person who's like assimilation at all costs. We must all get in line and pr present a good face to the world of who we are, you know, at, at all costs. Um, I think that can be just as toxic in the other direction. But I do feel that there's a balance that needs to be struck between um, finding ways of engaging in healthy dialogue and holding space for conflict and, and things like, you know, restorative justice and healing justice um, without moving into the territory of the second one, someone makes a misstep, they need to be called out and destroyed, ultimately. Yeah, so, um, so yeah. don't reach for the cosmic block button right away is, is sort of what you're saying there. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's this author who I really like, uh, Sarah Shulman, who wrote a book called Conflict is Not Abuse. And um, she talks about how she actually never blocks anyone because there can be a kind of uh, violence in, uh, in, in sort of preventing further dialogue from happening. Um, now, I wouldn't necessarily go that far. I definitely have some people on my block list. <laughs> but I'm inspired to look at that as, as a direction to move towards in the new year and looking at how do we both, um, and I don't claim to yet completely have the answer, but how do we continue to protect ourselves and our hearts in these dialogues when they can be very violent and harmful. Like I have friends who've been, you know, doxxed by the alt-right and then, you know, had their whole online personas have to be changed and, and altered because they were being trolled by like hundreds of people, thousands of people. Um, but so how do we protect from things like that, the very real toxicity in online culture, while also holding space open for actual transformation and change and dialogue across difference to occur? Well, yeah, it's almost, you know, it, it, you, I think what you're tabling there is very quote unquote shamanic because how do you, uh, how do you work through some of the challenges and, and maybe misperceptions that have, uh, even if they aren't innocent themselves, have innocently accumulated around someone? How do you work through them if not burning them off? Like you, you, you essentially keep the, uh, to push the metaphor, you essentially keep the the person possessed rather than uh, uh, having that particular thing um, worked through and burned off. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of times when these dialogues become toxic is when we go into them, and myself included, thinking I am right, this person is wrong, so I'm going to explain to them how wrong they are. Like, I think that nothing good can come of that. And in, in some ways, Facebook comments are kind of set up for that to be the structure of dialogue. Um, and I think, you know, from a shamanic perspective, we can't ask someone to do something that we are not willing to do. So if we are not willing 
to be changed by a conversation, then we can't really expect another person to be changed by a conversation. So I'm very interested in the kind of structures we can create using our spiritual technologies that we've developed as occultists and shamanic practitioners and you know pagans to be able to create containers for that type of dialogue where people are willing to be able to enter in and be changed. That's uh, create containers is an is an excellent way of, of describing that because we'll we'll move to the, the the positive side of that conversation. But a first step you mentioned Facebook comments, right? A first step sort of presents itself to me, which is uh, just before you do any of this stuff, before you use any of these platforms or whatever, kind of say to yourself, "This is not a representation of reality. This is a." Uh, <laughs> This is a corporate product designed to activate, you know, gambling centers in the brain. Like it's, it's designed to do what you're about to let it do to you. Um, mm-hmm. that, that little icon of a person isn't the person. Um, and so it's, a, that's the sort of pact we make using these platforms, uh, and potentially forget. Uh, by design, um, which is this is a corporate product and, and you are what they sell. So use them, but use them with that awareness. Um, but I would like that just seems to me when it, when it comes to um, you, you, you have that option or you have the, do you know what? No internet. And, uh, and that is laudable. Uh, but challenging in 2018. And, and so I think there's almost like a, a admit to yourself or describe to yourself an understanding of the limitations of these communication technologies and then attempt communication uh, sort of suggests like that would be my step one. And frankly, I do do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I am an optimist in the sense that I do believe even despite all of the ways that, you know, this, the conflict is sort of a feature, not a bug of these corporate platforms. um, I, I do believe that we can become the people who can engage even using these maybe harmful technologies in a way that is productive. Because I see people doing that work. I see people um, creating spaces online where that productive dialogue can happen. Um, And I'm really interested in that. Yeah, uh, me too. I mean, and that's why I kind of use the pact metaphor, I suppose, which is um, if if you, and I, this is going to be a weird way of describing it, but like if you think you work with spirits or you you do work with spirits, that that suggests to me that you have an appropriate metaphor for navigating these spaces, which is don't convince yourself you're it. Don't think it's universally nice because it's got pictures of your children on it. Um there, like it seems to me that we have in our lived experience. Uh, analogs that can be used for understanding. Because I agree, I'm broadly optimistic about if if you know the limitations or if you know its name to to make it a bit more <laughs> grimoireic. Like if you know what Facebook is and if you know what Twitter is, uh, and and really know it, then use it. Is uh, is is my optimism, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So talk me through this creating containers thing. I like that idea. Um, What's that? Well, I might start with just a a quote that really struck me that I heard. I was was attending the Allied Media Conference, um, and the keynote speaker was Alicia uh, Garza, the the co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Um, And she, part of her speech, she said, we must commit to organizing in a way that transforms us. We must build a movement across difference for the sake of our collective transformation. We must build movements that restore humanity to all of us, even those of us who have been inhumane. And so when I talk about creating containers, I think I'm talking about what are the skills we need um, as contemporary people to be able to organize in a way that Un- that transforms us, as as Alicia Garza was saying. How do we create the containers that hold, make a crucible in which that kind of transformative dialogue and organizing can occur? Um, so I guess how I would, like one basic way I would say of doing that is just coming with the basic premise, like you said, to come onto these social media platforms, understanding this is not the real person, this is not. Uh, 
this is not a platform that's neutral in a sense. I have to understand how am I navigating. And that's one one way to begin to create a container just with that understanding. But I think also the understanding of what are my beliefs and principles and how can I embody those beliefs and principles as I'm engaging with other human beings um, through social media platforms? Like, how do I not, even though I'm understanding it's not a real person necessarily, I mean, like, it's not the actual person that's live. There is a living person on the other side. And how do I make sure I'm not sort of throwing away the usual beliefs and principles that I would engage in on a daily basis when I'm engaging in social media? Those, that's two really good uh, steps there, I think. And they're all... Um, they all live inside one's head, to use that metaphor. But there is more, and what what you're kind of talking about there is is um, it's a bit Oprah, but um, bringing <laughs> bringing one's best self to it. And one of the things we were talking about in the email exchange is, and it's a rickety term for what's obviously an essential topic area, but energy hygiene. Mm-hmm. Um, are we all up to spec on this, in your opinion? And uh, and and what are some of the options for um, getting up to spec if we're not? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So, I guess how I think most people are not up to spec, so to speak. Uh, and I don't think I think that's through uh, you know no fault of people's own, really. I think it's mostly that there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I think for so long, the wider occult community in the sort of mainstream discourse is very focused on 101 stuff, which can be involved, these sort of basic energy hygiene techniques. Uh, people were hungry for something different, for, for visceral experience with spirits, for um, you know spells that are actually working and having an effect in their life, for effective ritual. And I think as a result of chasing um, those beyond one-on-one approaches, maybe some of the basic foundational one-on-one techniques have gotten tossed by the wayside. And again, I think I think with good reason, because so many of them were crouched in cosmologies that added, in my opinion and perspective, a lot of unnecessary layers onto what should be very basic practices. Like, for example, like a lot of people, when they talk to me about, when I talk about cleansing techniques to them, or, or um, grounding, you know, the, the first thing they're going to tell me is how they're doing, you know, lesser banishing rituals of the pentagram. And I'm like, that's great. That's a wonderful ritual that has very specific purpose. But that's not necessarily what you need to be doing when you just need to basically energetically cleanse yourself, from your home or, or ground a little bit, you know, the, these are different things. And I think, so I think people getting tired of all of the sort of, uh, Victorian era, era um, trappings that were put in a lot of these basic energy practices uh, in the West um, kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's keenly observed. So you, you mentioned uh, even if, okay, let's do it this way. If something like a lesser banishing ritual, which does have specific purposes that aren't quite energy hygiene, as you say, but if we're if people have thrown out the 101s, then what is a sort of less complex or even a sub-101 version of uh, energy healing? Like if, in this hypothetical conversation that you are having maybe with a client, uh, mm-hmm. what's an example of that? You just mentioned like, you know, one's body and one's house and so on. But like how basic can we make this to uh, uh, to kind of emphasize your point? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... I think it's helpful to have a really, really basic model of the energy body. Obviously, there's many different cosmologies, many different models with varying levels of complexity and layers that you can put onto as you study this kind of work. But at a very basic level, um, we have our, you know, you could say if you want to use the chakra system, we have our sort of major energy centers. We have a um, boundary that's around our bodies. It's kind of like an egg shape that that's what people have an experience of when someone's like in your space, like, you know, and someone's a little too close to you (laughs) or when you enter a bar and you feel everyone's kind of like glomming onto you because they're all drunk and you're not quite drunk yet. It's like all the boundaries becoming very loose and free is part of the reason people drink. Um, And the, so, so you have your energy body, your boundaries sort of containing that energy body. Then you have your aura, your auric field or your sort of emotional body um that's a big fluffy thing a bigger and around your boundaries that's constantly changing and shifting with your thoughts and your emotions um 
And then you also have your grounding cord that's sort of connecting you deep into the earth. And you have your central channel that sort of connects the above and the below. The, the sort of celestial and terrestrial energy is moving through your body, um, or what you might call your divinity and your humanity, coming together to form your sort of authenticity. Uh, so that maybe sounds a little more overly complex than I meant to make it, but at a basic level, you want to, first of all, make sure you're actually in your body. So many people that come to me are slightly hovering outside of their body or often completely um, curled up in a ball in their mind, refusing to drop down into their heart and their body because there's a lot of pain there that hasn't been addressed often. And our culture rewards that kind of um, intellectualism, so to speak, or the cutting off of the heart and focusing solely on the mind. So that's, that's an, often a problem I find is that when people are struggling because they really want to connect with the spirit world and they're having so much trouble getting out of their own way to do so, it's because they're so stuck in their head and their mind. And when I can help them to drop down into that heart space or that body space, then there's some real work to do around, okay, now what needs to be cleared out or shifted using sort of emotional clearing techniques or maybe journeying if there's deeper wounds like shamanic healing to allow them to be comfortable in their body and in their heart because they've ignored it for so long. See, uh, that is that, that very potent mental image of, of having um, yourself kind of curled up inside your own head. Does that suggest a, just for people listening, does that suggest an immediate visualization exercise of kind of breathing and, and, visualizing yourself dropping down from that cold up space into the body and 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 focusing on the actual nerve feelings and 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 muscle feelings of it to see because that seems like an instant diagnosis that I'm sure people listening to this are in fact doing right now that seems like an instant diagnosis of whether you are in your head or you're not because I really like that that's a that's a great mental image mhm yeah uh, i think uh, well a uh, meditation i often uh, lead people through before they do any work with me is helping them first to just like listen to the sounds in the room around them, then eventually start to feel the weight of their body on the chair they're sitting in and feel that chair rising up to hold the weight of their body and support them, feeling their feet on the floor. And then I lead them uh, to notice the feeling of the air on their skin. And then eventually move their awareness from the feeling of the air in their skin to a place in sort of the center of their head, almost there's like a little ball of white light there, and beginning to breathe into that center. And then I continue to guide them to go into each of their major energy centers, into their throat, into their heart, into their solar plexus, into their belly, and then into the bowl of their pelvis, just taking a deep breath into each of those places. And for some people, that in and of itself might be really hard. And I feel like, I don't know how to breathe, or I don't know how to breathe into a specific space in my body. Um, but beginning to follow that sort of image of a, of a glowing white ball moving through you can be very helpful for people to begin to locate their consciousness within the fullness of themselves rather than just in their head. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned beginning with the bodily awareness because uh, I get asked fairly often how one quote-unquote works with um, local spirits or land spirits. Mm. And, uh, and it's it, very often it's getting out of one's way is the challenge, as, as you just mentioned. And so what your, your description of opening that, um, that experience by focusing on the body and the, um, the feeling of the air on the skin and so on is exactly what I've been doing these last almost two weeks. Like I, I go and sit in back field or river field. This is my answer to people, by the way, um, who are, how do I work with, um, local spirits and it's that it is it's a bodily experience of the place initially and you, if you so if you can't get to the visualization as you're saying or the breathing thing to start with then do the bodily part for a week two weeks whatever and and you will get to it eventually because it is that getting out of your way it's if, if, how would you expect to experience uh, and this is not accusatory but like honestly how would you expect to experience local spirits if you're um, experience organ is malfunctioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point about local spirits. Um, I've had some really beautiful experiences with uh, um, certain spirits of the land. Like there's this one really deep um, water spirit in this desert uh, in Arizona 
where there's been a well running for, you know, centuries. Um, and through, it was really through my own work with the, with my emotional body and, and clearing the, you know, baggage or trauma there that I was able to cultivate this deep connection with that spirit and, and begin to talk with it and allow messages to be communicated with it and see how it wanted to be tended in different ways. Um, so yeah, what I, what you are saying has been my experience as well that, and I think it's another, it points out another reason why this work is so important to enter into our body and do the work necessary to clear what we're holding in our body that's, that's um, keeping us stuck or, or in trauma or triggered. Um, because when we haven't done that work, then when we're trying to connect with the spirits, the land, um, often we can interpret uh, the messages we're getting through our own pain and through, through that sort of filter of our own trauma. And I t- find the, the biggest way we notice when that's happening is when someone is experiencing spirit communication, but it's always like extreme huge messages, like it's always some giant cosmic thing or some really terrifying thing or some really, really dramatic, angry thing, you know, and it's, it's often like, oh, no, maybe the spirit was exhibiting a tiny bit of frustration. But because that's being filtered through your trauma, it seems like a raging spirit that needs to be stopped in some way or remediated immediately or everyone's going to die. Um, so I think a, an issue of um, being in our body and getting familiar with our own uh, symbolic language in that way and, and clearing our own trauma can help us to then have an accurate sense of scale when we're engaging with the spirit world, which is very important for creating those basic everyday connections with the land and not making it feel like a, like a trauma in and of itself just to do that. Yeah, the um, the scale thing is probably the word I was looking for because um, people want it to be, and you know, these are just you know generalizations and hot takes, but people generally want it to be a bit more Hollywood to start with. <laughs> um, they don't want to be told that it, you have to do, um, and and you are doing it. This is your experience of it when you are just aware of place. That's that is it happening. That's genuinely it happening there are um if it's sort of uh, music or a waveform there there's other information in the waveform that you can get to but um if you're experiencing place you are quote unquote working with place spirits that's just more dialogue in the signal than maybe you're not um you haven't kind of tuned in and it's a practice thing uh, to get to first and it's um Yes, I, I think so. Essentially, body and some kind of basic energy model. Let me tell you a. Uh, this is the most shamefully chaos magic thing. But if, if people are looking <laughs> for the least complex, particularly in in terms of sort of um, bodily experience and just sort of situating themselves in place, for my money, if people are looking for the least complex energy model for that to work, it is genuinely the Force from Star Wars just mm. genuinely feel the force. I'm not even kidding. They, they, that is about as basic as you can get. You will, as you said, kind of build up more nuanced ways that might be you specific or tradition specific for um, leaning into that. But if you're coming at this cold, you can just hear um, Obi-Wan Kenobi telling Luke what the force is and, uh, and, and sit in a field or sit in a park or, uh, or, or whatever it happens to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's that's a great point. I mean, definitely a part of my energy hygiene practice. It, it, it does involve Taoist practices, which are essentially, you know, um, sensing into chi and feeling how it moves in your body. Um, understanding that the Tao is this complementary dualist relationship between yin and yang, this force that's moving into expression and then coming back and bringing into context um, and. So for grounding, for example, there's, there's some very basic uh, Taoist forms that I find really helpful for grounding as well. I think are, would be hard to describe verbally on a podcast, but uh, the, that's, that's a big part of my practice. And I think for anyone, if you want to get beyond the basic 101, like if you're returning to these practices, but you're a more advanced practitioner and you're beyond like reading, oh, you should just visualize yourself being a tree in a book if you want to ground then I would suggest really seeking out those practices with the intention of grounding that allow you personally to feel I am fully in my body in this moment. 
And it might take you a bit if you, if you haven't really experienced that before. And a lot of people might have gone through most of their life without ever really experiencing being fully in their body, um, at least in our culture. And so um, for me, um, some um, Taoist forms of Qigong are very helpful for that. Uh, also, exercise can be very helpful for that for me. Um, another thing is uh, meditation. Uh, I specifically practice a form of uh, Zen Buddhist meditation, but just sitting down um, for like even 15 minutes and just following my breathing and maybe counting, you know, for each in and out breath one until you get to 10 and then starting back at one again. And if you don't quite make it to 10 because you get distracted, just, you know, returning gently to one again um, can be really, really grounding in the body, that way of following your breath and counting um, and help make you feel very present to your surroundings in a different way than just a simple visualization exercise might. So these are these are three good things. So what we have, um, you know, is 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 improved embodiment. And and when I say these are three good things, I want to bundle these up and put them in the context of the discussion, which is how we have uh, improved or more nuanced uh, interactions that make the world better rather than worse. And and we kind of talked about the communication platforms, but th this is the next step, which is you know, uh, bring all of you in this kind of aware and um, energetically hygienic uh, way to not just communication on corporate platforms, but but to life. But like, this is a step that I think when you when you watch people, and I, and I, as you say, I understand that. Well, I definitely understand uh, that. Really awful things will be said at you. Um, for genuinely no reason <laughs> as you navigate the internet. Um, but this is, this is one of the steps in, in kind of having you that, that container space. It's like, well, if we're going to have a container to have challenging interactions for presumably beneficial purposes, understand the platform and then, and then bring this kind of activated self to it, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess, so to talk more about containers, uh, to go back to boundaries, our, our, that's sort of like our own personal container that we're then bringing into these collective containers. And of course, any collective container is simply the sum total of our individual containers and how we're holding them. So um, I think it's important to understand what healthy boundaries feel like and look like. And I often find that people come to me really having no frame of reference for that. Um, so at a basic level, boundaries are like this egg shape that's surrounding your body. Um, they are flexible, fluid, and situational. So they can, you know, be very different if you're on a New York subway car versus uh, in a forest when you feel that sense of expansiveness. Um, and they also provide information. So it's, uh, again, like that feeling when you walk in a room where you get a bad feeling, that's generally coming from your boundaries, energetically speaking, that's telling you about the room and the space you're in. Because they're meant to sort of guide us towards that which is serving us and away from that which is harming us in any given moment. Um, they're also permeable. So you should be able to sort of draw in the energy that's nourishing you and helping you and filter out the energy that's stagnant or harmful or you need to, that's like sort of waste energy. Um, and they're responding first and foremost to your needs rather than the needs of others. So... Um, I think in the last podcast, I talked about how one of the first things that brought me to a shaman for healing was this really fucked up boundaries that I had um, around, uh, I would sort of ad adapt my boundaries to fit others' comfort before, rather than um, actually just standing in my boundaries and feeling them bump up against the other person's boundaries and being in healthy conflict for a moment and seeing where we stand and then moving on with our relationship based on that understanding. And so I would sort of, because I was very empathic, I would adapt um, to the version of my boundaries and myself that would best sort of serve that person that moment or that they would perceive as the most pleasant in the moment. Um, so I had to learn the hard way, uh, which is why I'm kind of passionate about boundaries, how to actually just stand my ground and be in my own healthy boundaries and allow them to actually be in service of protecting me in the way that I feel safe to be in my authenticity rather than um, 
conforming to meet the comforts of others. See, um, I find this fascinating, and you have obviously done uh, a lot of work on it. Um, so I, other than, I guess, um, uh, other than coming to you as a client, because I think this is essential. My first thought is you were talking about the adaptable boundaries, depending on where you are, and and almost the, the level of permeability in them reminded me of a, a, one of several conversations I've had with Connor Habib about sex and consent and whatever, because, you know, he's a sex activist. And, and it seems that if you don't have a, this is my immediate thought. So we're trying to universalize boundaries um, so that everyone is at a New York subway boundary at all times as, as a, um, <laughs> as a uh, low resolution universal solve for a lot of very real boundary challenges, um, you know, around the world extend, you know, going the whole way up to sexual assault and murder, obviously being the extreme examples. But one of the things that um, gets the turfs and the swerfs after Connor on Twitter is uh, attempting to table into that um, yelly, universalizing notion of boundaries at a New York subway level is that things like gay culture and gay clubs are different spaces where if you, you know, you've been to them, if you try to do the things in a gay club on the New York subway you will be arrested. And, and it seems that boundaries are not only an energetic and, and, um, and magical practice, but it's, it's, a, um, it's almost like a metaphysical category that requires additional thought. And somewhere in the way you described it, I think, is an opportunity to model both things, which is absolutely don't touch people on the subway. And also gay clubs have their own rules. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does make sense. And I think, you know, well, I, I just, well, that brings to my mind when you're speaking about that is, is some of my experience, a little bit of uh, gay culture in uh, Mumbai and in India as well, just, and just how different culturally different cultures can be with boundaries. So I think that that's important to mention as well, which I didn't say how I think your, your point about different spaces, perhaps having different appropriate boundaries uh, is also true of different cultures, which is sure. very interesting. Yeah. Um, so how do we, not- like, this is great. I mean, <laughs> you're the right person to ask this, right? Because as you said, you've done a lot of personal work on it. And then I presume uh, a lot of client work on it because I'm, I'm just learning a whole bunch of stuff that I'm going to take away and, and think with myself now. But um, what is stuff people can do? Right now, if they're like, ah, oh, this is this is interesting. Other than, I mean, my first thought, whatever you think, is that you have absolute sovereignty over your boundaries at all time. So that's a that's a thing that you can learn there, which means you you can dial it up and dial it out if you're intentionally in a space like a gay club versus a subway and and so on. But I mean, how else? What are some pretty good first steps for people like myself, just suddenly realizing I haven't thought about my boundaries as much as I probably should. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first step uh, is admitting you have the problem. (laughs) The first step is basically... I'll add it uh, to the list of my problems. Carry on. (laughs) No, the first step is uh, assessing what are your boundaries actually like? Because, you know, for many people, this is sort of a new concept. So they might have had, you know, experiences just like any human being, people being in their space or not. So they know what boundaries are in, in essence. But they maybe have never really used, especially people who have, you know, spiritual gifts or familiar with the etheric body a little bit, use their skills to really look at their own boundaries. Um, Like we're so focused on trying to perceive spirits, sometimes we're not really looking at our own spirit well, um, I find, as a cultist. So um, what you can look at, you can, there's sort of two components. So it gets a little uh, tricky talking about it. One component of boundaries is just our everyday physical interactions. Like, you know, energy isn't some abstract thing, it follows our choices that we make, and it mirrors them, like as above, so below, as within, so without kind of stuff. So um, looking at, like, is it easy for you to say strong yeses and nos? Are you able to, like, ask for what you need clearly and proactively in a situation like you were talking about, I think, consent? Um, And is it generally, do you generally feel safe and protected as you move through the world? Do you feel like you can trust your instincts? And are you comfortable standing in conflict, um, whether it be internal or external? Like all these are basic questions to begin to look at what are what is the health of my boundary just 
based on my daily human interactions. But then there's also the energetic component to boundaries um, that is maybe more about scanning your boundaries and seeing what they look like visually to you or what they feel like kinesthetically to you, whatever sort of psychic senses are strongest for you. Um, like, do I have a lot of holes? Or do my boundaries cover my front, but my back's totally exposed? Is, are my, is my the head or my, or my grounding totally exposed? Um, and just starting to notice where, what energy habits do I currently have around my boundaries? Are my boundaries really stiff? Like, do I always feel like I have to be very guarded and closed, like the New York subway boundaries, or, or am I able to expand and open? Um, so uh, just on a basic level, doing an assessment is a great place to start. Um, but then there's also practices, both everyday physical and Taoist practices that you can do, and not necessarily Taoist, but just, so on a very basic level, anyone can sort of call down this true yang energy to strengthen and repair their boundaries. Because from, from a Taoist perspective, yang energy or like that divine energy of the above, celestial energy, is this energy that's protective, it's purifying, it's going to be playful, it's blessing, it's sort of generous. It's like you, so you can just choose to call down those forces and visualize that sort of golden energy from above strengthening the container of your own boundaries. And just doing a small meditative practice like that can be to go a long way towards beginning to create new energy habits and beginning to see your boundaries as more whole rather than having all these holes in them or being very weak. Um, then you can also, when you're grounding, call up that yin energy of the earth, um, which can weave in sort of a warp and weft of your boundaries, the above and below, um, get, cause creating a better container that also is grounded, is also connected to the earth, is also nourishing, um, is also the earth energy is very like repairing and soothing if there's like sort of ragged edges to your boundaries or, or wounded places. Um, and then once you have called in both of those energies, then you can call in any spirit helpers you have to strengthen and protect those boundaries because those are our, our energy. Our spirit help isn't going to come in to strengthen our boundaries unless we ask them to, because they would consider that an invasion of our boundaries. Like again, as we, as I talked about in the last, uh, podcasts our spirit helpers want to work with us as adults they don't want to they're, we're not they're not like these omniscient you know daddies and and mommies that are gonna like you know take care of us they want to be like co-creative partners often with most helping spirits i shouldn't make a broad general generalization um and so they're going to wait for us to ask them to strengthen our boundaries because otherwise they'd be intruding on our boundaries but when we do ask for that help even if we have like the flimsiest boundaries, as long as we have some semblance of boundaries, they can make them very strong. And what I find is that kind of tends to last until from about like, you know, sunrise to sunset, then you got to do it again, in a sense. This is fascinating for me. I'm definitely going to do the, uh, definitely going to do the first part that I, I'm reasonably good with stellar visualization. Um, but I, I'm going to, I'll probably hit you up after the show about this a, a few more times because I'm interested in, where that can go. And I think, uh, I think it is an area that would require, I mean, for people out there as well, I mean, um, this is what you have experts for, I guess, but I'm going to think about that. I, I like it. Um, speaking of the last show, um, we only briefly touched on joining uh, in the last show, but I want to do something a bit more deeper dive uh, on the concept now, particularly as the premium members have just run through a whole bunch of different methods in our journeying course, uh, which is in the premium members area, obviously. And uh, we were kind of spitballing some topic areas there. And, uh, and so I guess there's a couple of things that you suggested that I'm very interested in. So from a journeying perspective, you said it would be good to talk about crafting better questions. Uh, what did you mean by that? Mm. Yeah, so I find one thing that can really hamper people's development uh, when they're first learning to journey is this not really knowing what to ask or not really knowing how to, um, like so much of journeying is asking questions, interpreting the answers, then taking actions based on those interpretations. But if you're only journeying on sort of abstract questions or like deep spiritual questions, then you're often going to end up in sort of spiritual bypass territory where your journey is just an escape you use 
rather than something that's actually a transformative practice that's changing you and your life. Um, and so part of crafting good questions first is just being willing to ask the hard questions, the questions that actually affect things that are going on in your life right now. And actually, like as a whole, the, the occult community is maybe perhaps better than that than some other communities because so many of us are very focused at this point in the, the occult game on uh, real concrete ordinary reality. Like, you know, how can I generate more money in my life? How can I um, you know, be in better health? How can I uh, you know, get this new job I'm trying to get? Um, so I think that's actually not as much of a problem I see anymore. Um, that's more of a problem I see maybe in like more new age communities. Um, so to speak. But if so, if you already know that you're looking at your life as it is and actually looking at your current reality and see like this is the reality of my life right now, then and beginning to craft questions based on that current reality um, and your understanding of where you're trying to get to, that's a good first step. So um, can I just, then, if, if I'm understanding you, um, that like now I'm getting what you mean by better questions and I, I like this. Uh, so in the new age community, it, which... It's probably a reasonable statement, and you would be more inclined to get um, for people to initially offer a, a a journeying objective that is a bit too wishy washy where there are more immediate needs because perhaps they don't know or haven't given themselves permission to journey on immediate needs. Like, uh, I want to do some journeying on my substance abuse challenges, or why do I never seem to be able to? like get to the end of the the pay week uh, without any money, like the things that the, the actual transformative things that we would focus on from a magical perspective, be it sigil magic or so on. Is that the same? Is that what you mean? Like there, there's a difference in the questions. You can emphatically journey on um, what it is about you and carbs or, <laughs> or something. You can emphatically journey on that. Yes, absolutely. Um, but then the other thing you have to bring in is an understanding of sort of how the spirit world works and how spirits understand our questions. So oftentimes, at least from you know, the perspective of my cosmology and shamanic cosmology, spirits aren't interested in the de- as much of the details of the story that we get lost in as human beings. They want to make things much more simple, and they want to be working at the true root of things, not... But so we have to really be careful that we're not carrying into our questions assumptions um, based on our understanding of the surface nature of our problems, that we're leaving enough space open in the question as we're asking about this specific problem in our life to allow for a fuller answer that really gets to the root of what needs to change, not just stuck in the details of the story. Um, so in that so, case, if we use the hypothetical, it's a silly one, I should have picked a better one, of, uh, <laughs> of carbs, like, would it be, uh, in aggregate, would it be like, well, I want a journey on addiction. I, w- I want to, like, uh, I, I want to see what's, where that um, disconnect or damage is and, uh, and what we can do to restore it. Is that kind of where you go from surface level down to the deeper and, frankly, scarier stuff? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so in, this is also where cosmology really comes in handy because it gives us a sort of map that we can use to ask these sorts of questions. So for example, if you're bringing up a question um, about eating and, and carbs and you know it has something to do with addiction, in my cosmology, that locates me in the South with the archetypal teachers of healer and death. And the, the in the South, the sort of heart and fear addiction pattern is addiction to intensity in, in my cosmology. So I might, if I was asking this question on my own behalf, I would then maybe be going to those specific helping spirits I know are located in that place in my cosmology for this question. And I would maybe be asking them, understanding that like often we're in addiction because we're, we think we can't or we are afraid to do something else that would truly meet a need. So instead, we're going sort of around and around that actual need in a circle in the addictive pattern, which addictions are always very repetitive. Um, I'd be asking, so like, what is the the true nature of what what, what I'm wanting to be doing instead of of eating carbs, you know, like what, what is, 
what is the, that's, I'm not phrasing it quite right, but it's more like, what are carbs replacing in my life at this time? Like, please that's show good. me. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's a good question because, uh, well, uh, to my mind and from my experience of journeying, because as you say, if you let the spirit world or the journeying realm or whatever you want to call it uh, do what it's going to do, it will it'll be oh, it's this. It, it, it's it's almost like a a DMT elf experience. It's if you get the <laughs> the question right, it will just surface. It will be like it's this, and uh, and I think a lot of people. I certainly was. Um, when you kind of look at okay, well, this is this is dysfunctional in my life, and if you do dig down to what that macro thing is, if it's addiction, you go, oh, but I like some of my addictions. I don't know if I'm like, <laughs> and you go, oh, but I shouldn't like some. I, I that's interesting, and you've hit that hit that point where you go, okay, um, deep breath, and it's potentially one of the reasons people think journeying is scary because you can encounter. Um, and you can uh, encounter rather scary things in there, but it's also that um, if you if you give the unconscious or whatever you want to call it, like pure clear permission to show you stuff, be ready for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess what I often find then is there when people ask these questions, they might have a lot of guilt and fear and and assumptions built in to the question that they're asking. So of course, it's a scary thing to enter into if you think like, oh, they're going to tell me something that I love that I have to stop doing, or, or they're going to tell me something I have to do that I don't really want to do. Um, and I think it's good to remember then that journeys are not generally just about asking one question and getting an answer. They're about really, again, understanding who you are currently, what your life is like currently, and then getting just the next step you can take that feels right for your life at this time. So yeah, sometimes those can be uncomfortable steps, but generally our spirits aren't going to come down again with that like angry wagging finger and tell us you have to do this because you're a bad person, <laughs> which is I think we bring in from like a Christian background sometimes the, the assumption that that's going to happen or even just our family of origin patterns. Um, rather, they're going to show us, okay, these are the outcomes of the actions you're currently taking. This is this will be the outcomes you change those actions. So um, we just want to let you know that. And then you have to decide, what am I going to do now that I have this knowledge? What do I want to do now that I have this knowledge? Um, and they're often helping kids are happy to let us continue to make the same mistakes if that's what we want to do. Yeah, well, um, that kind of lands uh, tangentially. In the journeying course, we spend a lot of time, uh, because I'm, I'm fascinated with the document, um, the Red Book, uh, we spend mm-hmm. a lot of time... Uh, it, it, it turns out the guy who, you know, essentially invented depth psychology was some sort of secret journeying wizard and he didn't want the book published. And then so we've had this odd situation where um, Carl Jung has the opportunity to um, transform two centuries of, of, of kind of exploring one's unconscious because the book only became available in the 21st century. But uh, one of the things that has got me stuck on it is – you have to make something physical or ha- have a physical action following, we'll call it a journey in, in this case. That's what he would do. So he would make, and that's why the Red Book exists, he would make art out of his, um, let's call them journeying experiences. And that is a very interesting match to um, a number of indigenous cosmologies around the world, including um, several Australian Aboriginal ones, where um, when you wake up from dream, you have to do something in waking space to acknowledge the the memory of that dream. So if you dreamt about, um, you you would do things like you, you'd go down to the river or the billabong and, and essentially compose a song, uh, a brief song about the dream so that the waking spirit world knows that you're a person who can move between them. And it's this idea of it's not being in your head. Um, and I, what you were just saying about the spirits giving you that next step um, rather than the finger wag and and so on as you go in these experiences is is that a step that people very often miss which is to kind of bring into the uh, physical world some form of response or manifestation from from the journeying and do you think that has a feedback loop so we'll do it as two questions because i think it has a feedback loop i think you get better at it if you do this and that was jung's experience as well but like is this one of the things that we, um, one of the steps that falls off quite often? Yes. And I would say that uh, 
actually even more so than not taking the step of taking an action is not understanding that sometimes the action you need to take is another journey. Mm. Um, so to, not to go off too off track, but oftentimes people get an answer in journey. They're like, oh, I don't really know what that means. I guess maybe it means this. I guess I'm just not going to do anything. Or they'll do something that's kind of half-baked. They're not really sure why they're doing it. Um, and in my experience, it's very imp- sure. At the beginning, it's great to just dive in and try to take some kind of action that you can, like maybe create a piece of art out of what you did, like, like Jung often did, or maybe um, you know go do something in the world. But even more important is to be willing to say, okay, I get this and this and this, but this part of the journey really didn't make sense to me. So now I'm going to refine my question and ask a more pointed, precise question and go back in to see what that particular piece of the journey meant. And then I'm going to go back and do it again as long as necessary until I really have a full sense of what I'm being told and what the next action is that would best serve me to take. Yeah, I love that. Um, it, it's a it's a keenly observed point because uh, I experience the same thing um, taking people through the sigil course where I kind of have to remind them, like, you know you're not being taxed per sigil. Like, you know, it's you're not getting on a plane, you're not buying a plane ticket every time you journey. It's free. Um, and I think people, um, it, it takes a while. It's not even just a, a general comment about people. It's it's an experience-based thing, which is to realize that this is a, um, this is you asserting, uh, you know, sovereignty over an organ of your consciousness. Like, this is a thing you do as a human naturally. Um, it's not, it's not breaking out the silverware for a special occasion. Uh, you can, in, in fact, go and, and, uh, and dig more into it. Yeah. And I think some, some a place where actually journeying and sigil uh, making differ in the, uh, sort of the opposite direction is that, Sometimes I also see the problem of people over journeying. Like they're very enthusiastic. They just started their their journey. They're taking actions like every every hour, you know, like of the day. Um, and I think, like you were talking about, how it's a feedback loop that increases your skill over time. Um, that's absolutely true in my experience. And if we're not taking time to actually receive that feedback from the world once we've taken our actions or our body or our spirit, then um, we can often very quickly get completely off our center and wind up in very sort of dangerous territory, I find. Yeah, I um, I, I wonder if there's anything, I, I guess other than maybe politely mentioning it to someone, I wonder if there's anything you can do to correct that when they're on a, um, when they're on a journeying high or, or do you just let <laughs> it run its course? Because uh, it, the other thing is it's pretty amazing. Once you get past, and this was, um, I think we've kind of, answered it by saying one of the ways you know it's not you're not making it up is when the world responds and you start earthing it and 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 that changes that's been i think that's largely why uh well not largely why i think that's an essential component of why the doing something in the physical following a journey or or whatever is is so potent because it's the it's the yardstick that kind of allows you to learn, well, this was an authentic experience or not. But once you get past that, I'm not actually making this up. Um, Mm -hmm. It's extremely exciting to start with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if there's anything I would necessarily say to someone, except that I would caution them to take that time to actually see what was the response to their action, to be a little bit of a scientist about it, you know? Um, Like, okay, so I'm taking my journey, then I'm experiencing the journey based on the question I crafted as, you know, and just letting it happen. I'm trying not to interpret overly much as I'm experiencing the journey. Then after I receive the interpretation and write it down, you know, or sorry, after I write the journey down and and interpret it, then I'm taking an action based on that interpretation. And sometimes that action is to ask another question. And now once I've taken that action out in the world, then I have to go back and look at my notes and see, did the world respond in the way that I expected based on my interpretation of this journey, or did it not? And if not, maybe I need to, before I go on to the next journey, go back and journey again. And why was my expectation so different from what actually happened? Where's the gap? And how do I begin to close that gap? I think that's how our, our ability to get better at journeying and refine our understanding of our symbolic language doesn't just happen. It happens through that careful observation. Um, of the response to our action because otherwise we're just you know doing magical shamanism in our head yeah 
Yeah, that's that's solid advice. You, that's the kind of, um, it, it's almost like an evolutionary effect on on genetics that you have there. Like, yeah, absolutely. And weirdly, there is a corollary um, in in sigil magic where people, um, yeah, it's it's not taking the time and then not working out or not analyzing why and, and just attempting to re up. So I get questions like, can I reuse the same um, sigil or sigil statement? if it didn't work and I'm like, well, if it didn't work, um, <laughs> are you, are you coming at this correctly rather than just going, okay, I haven't got that yet. I'm just going to keep whacking away at it until literally in sigils magic case, I suppose in some cases. Um, yeah. Um, are you approaching this correctly Has the universe, like the world uh, responded to it yet? And if it didn't work, why would you keep doing it? And it's, that is, that comes with experience. I'm glad we're having this conversation so that people know that that's, that is a component of what it is we do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, lucky last um, Johnny in question, um, because I think we've done, done quite a bit of that deep dive. Uh, we, we sort of, I'll link up to the previous show uh, in the show notes, because you, um, you helpfully put together some places people can go if they want to um, get a journey in 101. And, and this has been some really worthwhile additions to, once people are past that or through that is better. Uh, use of constructs. What are we, uh, what are we talking about there? Mm. Yeah. So this is something that was introduced to me in my shamanic community. Um, and so constructs are something that we can use when we need to accomplish the impossible in a journey. So uh, you know, I think you find these in many different occult traditions, um, or like even if you talk about like sort of the, um, you know, mind palaces and things like that can be a form of an energetic construct that you create to perform a specific purpose. In that case, the impossible thing you're trying to do is remember a huge text, perhaps. Um, so the, a construct can be something like, um, one example is when we do... Uh, trying to think of the, be- the best example where I have to give the least explanation. I think, uh, well, for example, we have a cosmology that we use, and we actually craft a sort of construct, so to speak, of that cosmology in the spirit world that hooks into the larger cosmology, so we can kind of organize all of our spirit relationships on this map in the spirit world. So when we enter into the spirit world, then that cosmology is responding to us and we can, we can actually literally walk through our own cosmology. Um, and I think many indigenous cultures have different, different ways of doing that or engaging with the spirit world in that way. They're kind of like these, you know, cosmologies as a subset of constructs are kind of like these uh, superhighways in the spirit world that so many people have walked this particular path, it's easier to engage um, with certain areas of the spirit world through these specific pathways. Um, Interesting. So yeah. a, a construct is, and I don't mean this in a negative sense that it, it usually is, but a construct is is human impact in the spirit world. Is is that a way? Like, and and as a result, it can be, as you said, things like memory palaces. And uh, I like the idea of a of a map of a cosmology within a map of a cosmology. That's almost uh, I, I see the utility in that, but I also see almost the humor. Like it's a very <laughs> it's a very Terry Pratchett thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so what I would say about the, uh, I just flew out of my head what I was going to say. Well, anyway, with, with uh, constructs, they're not just human impact. They're, they are made by humans, so to speak, but they're, I only, when I've worked with constructs, the best constructs are usually made in partnership with your helping spirits. So gotcha. it's sort of like, yes, energy follows our thought to some extent. You know, as human beings, we can shape um, our reality a bit in that way. But to make something that's really lasting and really functional, I generally find you have to be working in partnership with your helping spirits um, to actually build the thing, the structure in the spirit world. Um, then they might need the marching orders from you. Cool. All right. Well, I want to throw in uh, one last bonus question so we can tie the show together. Uh, do you need, so in the kind of classic um, and fine anthropologically incomplete or in need of update description of shamanism or a shaman um bringing that forward to today do you need say permission to journey on behalf of one's community or is being part of it 
sufficient permission or is it permission for a kind of journeying? Let's pull um, journeying and consent and interaction and improvement <laughs> of community together with that question. Uh, that's a great question. So <sighs> journeying on behalf of community, I find works best when you're not journeying alone. So, and when we're journeying with the consent of your community. So what, first we have to define community, I guess. So I'm specifically defining community as a group of people who have agreed to be in community together. They share certain beliefs and principles and they share certain skills and they're working towards a shared vision together. Um, so that's, that's how I would define community for these purposes. So if you're trying to journey on behalf of that type of community, like for my shamanic community, for example, um, what we do is we would work in pods. So we do something called podification, where there are at least three people that have to be going on a journey and asking a specific question. So we all have to make sure the question is worded exactly the same way. And we generally are often working in a construct as well as a group of people that we share. So it's like this shared energetic landscape as well as communicating. That's not necessarily necessary, but that's, um, that's one way of doing it. Um, and so after we receive the answers from our helping spirits, then we're podifying them, which means we're going to each share the essence of our interpretation of our answer. And we're going to talk about where the resonance is, where are things standing out. And it's not about like, oh, we all got this, we all got the color red. So that means red is important for this question. It's not about that, though sometimes that often happens that there's big resonances throughout. But it's more about what is the greater answer that we can receive that we couldn't have received. That's more than the sum total of our individual journeys based on us three journeying on the same question. And then we're also responsible for our own journeys in discerning what is my own personal symbolic language, maybe not so important to the greater questions, interpretation, and what are the pieces that I know are essential to this journey that I just took? And, and standing up for those pieces that are essential as we discuss the answers to the journey until finally we come out with this answer that's, again, is bigger than any one of us could have received on our own to a question. Very interesting. So, um, so generally speaking, permission um, and and community is yes, definition based. So maybe not. Um, well, you, here's the thing. Here was here was my answer to that, right? Or a potential thought to table. Um, Let's swap the word community for neighborhood. Let's do, let's assume yeah. what if you're in a high crime neighborhood or you have a, which everyone more or less does, but like a corrupt um, local governance structure or there are things wrong with it. I was, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to work out is I think you can journey on that because you are, um, you can journey on either your p component of it or you can fix it because you're in it. And it, it's weird. Like the reason I asked the question is it does come back to things like consent and boundary again, which is um, I probably like, can you journey for um, orphans in a war zone? Uh, because I'm not a war zone orphan. Probably yes, but it's, it's, <laughs> or, or is prayer better in that situation? Do you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm trying to situate where, we have where we do journeying and community and consent because like the boundaries thing, I wonder if we give it um, sufficient thought um, that is required for where we are in the timeline. Yeah. So I would say a few different answers to that question. It's a very complex question. I think first at a base level, sure. You want to journey on like the true root of um, crime in your neighborhood. Why not go do it and see what happens. Then where consent comes in to me is when you're then saying, okay, I received this answer from spirit. So now you all have to do this thing yeah, because I yeah. am the truth, you know, I'm the prophet, you know? So first of all, that's why it's helpful to have more than one person journeying on something. So it's not just your personal truth that you're so, you know, fixated on and you actually have a group of people that are, that have decided together on an answer that you're all going to work together to affect change with. Um, so I think I would say, like, get people together in your neighborhood to journey together. But then also, um, there's this understanding that when you journey, you're not, like, you're not really seeing absolute truth. You're seeing one truth. 
And that doesn't mean that you can't use it to take action in the world that is effective, but you need to understand that this is not about you dictating the one true way to everyone else in your neighborhood. It's about you having a new dimension of understanding that you can then use to inform your actions and maybe how you communicate with other people and how you organize people. But you don't, don't use that journey you just took as your proof that you have to be listened to because you're righteous, you know, in some way. That's that makes Yeah, I think that's the solve. So you can journey on um, neighborhood crime or whatever it happens to be, but when it comes to that bringing it into the physical, um, it's, it's your journey, even if it was somewhere else. So that informs your subsequent actions. Yeah, like I've seen some problems with people, even just on an interpersonal level, where they'll do a journey and they'll have trouble understanding this is their subjective journey. So even if they, let's say they see someone is like harming them in some way in that journey, then you have to compare your interpretation of that journey with how does that person actually interact with you on a daily basis? Like, you know, what is your relationship like? Do you want to make start, start a dialogue with that person? Do you want to maybe, um, you know, see what's going on in your relationship together? Um, rather than saying, okay, because my spirit said this person is harming, now I have to go curse them, or now I have to like call them out and tell people they're dangerous or something. You know, it's like, there's this need to understand that journeying is one piece of evidence that we need to bring into all our other cognitive abilities and skills, the perception of our mind, you know, our emotions, our observations and physical ordinary reality. It's kind of like being a detective, which I think, you know, Twin Peaks is a great example of. When you see them, he's, he's taking in these, uh, you know, Agent Cooper t- is taking in these different um, methods of divination and, and spirit advice and dreams, but he still has to find the actual ordinary reality evidence to solve the crime. And so I think it's important that people understand that when they're engaging with spirit communication in any realm, whether it be journeying or divination, that you're not, again, taking it as this absolute truth that you now are the one person who has. That's lovely, because uh, what that's done is, is bring us full circle right to the beginning, which is things you can do um, to become more coherent, but also be aware of, of maintaining coherence as uh, um as a necessary first step in 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 our interactions um, with the world, so well done. We did that really well. We, we went <laughs> we went full circle and landed by. That's quite neatly uh, quite neatly journeyed there, Langston. Um, yeah. Well, I uh, I always love these chats. Uh, I feel like it's been too long, and I'm I'm very grateful that um, we got to have an episode with nice audio quality at uh, this time. But uh, for people who want to do more about the kind of stuff we just spoke about and what you got going on and, uh, and the such lay it on us. Yeah. Thank you. My um, website is occupy dash your dash heart.com. And uh, you can find there uh, some of my online classes. I actually have another emotional clearing class coming up uh, in February on the 10th. Um, and it's five Saturdays. Uh, and the class will really be focused on how do we begin to create that sort of healthy energy hygiene? How do we begin to uh, use our discomfort or triggers we feel in the moment to um, find those places inside us that we need to uh, bring back um, or uh, heal to begin to come into greater wholeness and well-being and refine our ability to communicate with the spirit world? Um, and I also, on my mailing list, if you sign up for it, I have a free ebook that specifically talks about cultivating healthy boundaries. People might be interested in that as well. Yeah, very good. Nice one. Well, for people listening, that will, of course, uh, that'll all be in the show notes. So if you're, if you're driving or if you're away from uh, your desk or so on, that's where it'll be. And, uh. Yes, Langston, I, uh, this has been a good journey and welcome back from uh, your long journey. And, uh, and, and just thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gordon. Some great stuff to take away with you there. 
a bunch of techniques on grounding, embodiment, boundary management, and journeying tech. Uh, in the show notes, you will find, among other things, a link to Langston's previous appearance, as that time he helpfully compiled some additional journeying resources. It's worth mentioning there is also an entire course on it in the premium members area if you want to take it a bit further. And, uh, and that concludes the Head Game series for January. Connor Habib, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, Lynn McTaggart, and Langston Khan. Loads more coming up already on the show, so be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcatcher on YouTube or at runesoup.com. Check out the RuneSoup Facebook page and or find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.